Today's guest is Jacob Zeman. Uh, Jacob is a partner and portfolio manager at Glynn Capital Management. Uh, Glynn Capital is focused on investments in private and public technology growth companies. Uh, the firm was founded 50 years ago. Is that right, Jacob? That's exactly right. This is actually exactly our 50th anniversary. Congratulations. Thanks for joining me today, Jacob. No, thank you so much, Alex, for having me. Um, Super happy to do it. This is this is what we love doing, talking about technology. So, um, so happy we could come together today. Well, I've been really looking forward to this uh, episode because Jacob has been right at the forefront, uh, witnessing AI innovation up close, and we're going to spend the the session talking about all artificial intelligence. Uh, Jacob, you regularly interface with uh, pioneers from top private and public companies. And you've been kind of doing this during this entire phase as AI has really started to take off. Uh, so I feel like you have a pretty unique vantage point. Um, I also appreciate that you have a talent for taking complex concepts and breaking them down into easily understandable explanations, which I think is critical for talking about AI. So wh why don't we just start with your background? Uh, you clearly have a passion for investing and technology. Uh, which came first and what originally sparked your interest in each? Yeah, of course. You know, I think they really came about pretty much in parallel. So, you know, my dad was an Air Force officer. We grew up um, in Europe for 15 years. I went to Dodd schools, the Department of Defense schools. They were very well funded. There was lots of technology in the classroom. Uh, my parents spent, you know, a huge amount of their income on bringing computers home, a lot of money on dial up internet from Telecom Italia. And so really invested a lot in, in technology, both in school and at my house. And in parallel with that, like a lot of stories, I had this you know, incredible teacher uh, in fourth and fifth grade who was just this super saver, who was super passionate about investing and made millions of dollars uh, just through saving on a teacher's salary and investing. And I think he saw in me someone who was a little bored in the classroom, um, who was, you know, interested or potentially interested in, in investing and could really be someone who worked and collaborated with him and he could teach me a lot. And so, you know, those two things were happening at the same time. And then, you know, we would find stocks to buy and I would write up little write-ups of why I was buying them, send that to family members, work on those with him. You know, the first two stocks I bought were EasyJet and Microsoft. So two companies I used every day. Um, you know, and it's funny looking back on that. I, you know, in EasyJet's case, I was buying this business that was the definition of a business that was commoditizing, trying to be a low-cost provider, literally a race to the bottom. <laughs> on the other side, I was buying, you know, this this compounding massive no company. At the time, I had no idea, but looking back, it's it's pretty funny. Those were those were the two businesses I I bought. So let's, let's talk about AI. Uh, when did you first learn about AI? And how did you go about educating yourself? Yeah, the first time I really jumped into AI uh, in a really dedicated way was actually when we were investing in Facebook um, and a whole host of these you know, web 2.0 companies where machine learning aspects of AI were really critical to building the revenue models of these businesses. That sort of personalization, targeting of ads, that was really sort of the cutting edge um, of where machine learning was at the time. And machine learning is really the foundation of AI. And then we were also looking at a lot of fraud prevention use cases and the businesses that were driving that, you know, companies like Palantir. Uh, and so that's when we first got deep into it. And then, you know, as part of being a part of the industry, talking to entrepreneurs, got to spend a lot of time looking at graphical processing units, the business businesses that were building those, the sort of massive parallel computing that was coming about at that time, following businesses like DeepMind, thinking about you know, how that was potentially going to change so many industries. Even just small things stick out in my head, like more than 10 years ago, you know, riding around in Palo Alto in some of the first self-driving cars where you know, there was the, the entire back of the car was just servers and machines and they were super hot and super loud and weighing down the whole vehicle and just this incredible you know set of sensors outside the car and at that time looking at that and thinking i don't know how this is ultimately going to work but it seems like over the long term this is going to be pretty exciting 
And so those are some of the physical things I, I gripped onto in the middle there. And then I think one of the, the very last pieces that really got me interested uh, was this book called you know, Super Intelligence by Nick Bostrom. And I think this book was just, was just really formative in thinking about um, what are all the ways that AI could potentially supplement, but also eventually surmount humans. And what are the potential rewards and risks of that? I think that book was really influential for a lot of technologists, um, Bill Gates, Elon Musk, Sam Altman. And really after reading that book is when OpenAI got formed to, to really you know, work with how do we harness AI in a way that's positive for humanity and, and avoid some of the negatives that, that were in that book. And so Elon Musk and Sam Altman forming this you know, incredibly important company really grew out of that. And then obviously today, there's so many resources um, beyond that. So those are, those are the key things in my mind. Those are the, the sort of the, you know, learnings, things I read that really stick out over the last you know, 15 years. And obviously, you're learning all along the way as well and talking to companies and learning from them. Yeah. And I think like a lot of technologies, it, it looks really slow initially. Uh, it, it, it seems like a toy. And then you have this acceleration. And I think human beings are really difficult at thinking about, you know, um, you know, accelerating growth or compounding growth that isn't linear. And so you heard, you know, small amounts about AI kind of slowly built. And right now we're in that, you know, parabolic curve where it's not just linear advancements. It's literally linear advancements every, you know, few, you know, weeks, <laughs> few months. And then over the course of a year, you say, wow, that curve is actually big and actually accelerating. And so we're in that period where it isn't these small whispers and things that look like toys and experiments. We're at that point where growth has broken out and is no longer linear and advancements around AI. So before we, we jump in uh, into AI, would you share your career path and kind of what, what uh, brought you to where you are today? Yeah, of course. So I went to Pomona College, which is a small liberal arts school, you know, really close to Alec, to you um, down in Southern California. I spent every summer and for all my summers and then um, internship at Morgan Stanley up in San Francisco, entirely focused on working with private equity firms, uh, mainly focused on technology buyouts. Definitely came into that knowing I wanted to be an investor, knowing that that was the stepping stone to that. Every single one of my peers went to one of our private equity clients. I skipped that whole formal process, knew I wanted to invest, knew I wanted to stay in San Francisco, uh, do technology here, be at the center of that, uh, and really be close to the process. So I wanted to really drive investment decision making, and I knew I had to go to a small firm to do that uh, and not just you know manage process like a young person at a, at a big private equity firm. And, you know, I courted Glenn Capital, or we courted each other <laughs> for almost a year. Uh, and it's been such a great decision to really grow up the last, you know, 14 plus years inside of Glenn Capital, learn at the feet of John Glenn, the founder of our firm, you know, really just this legendary investor in Silicon Valley, uh, who's invested in every single cycle from semiconductors to databases to the internet, uh, and now, you know, AI and software. Uh, and so it's just been incredible to learn from someone who had a you know front row seat and really make his own investment style uh, mine in many ways. Oh, that's great. Okay, so let, let's talk about AI. Uh, and let's do it. We, yeah, let, let's do it. Uh, it's a it's not an easy task. Uh, so so the, my my first question, uh, maybe even the most difficult, how would you explain AI to someone who has been out of touch? for the last 30 years that has never heard of it, it knows nothing about it? Big question. I think at a very high level, just thinking definitionally, um, AI is really a branch of computer science. What ultimately builds up to delivering AI is machine learning. And machine learning is really about taking algorithms, so complex math, to look at large amounts of data and then identify patterns over time, at points in time, and so think about it this way, uh, you have enormous pieces of data, you run algorithms against that, that's called machine learning. <laughs> machine learning is an offset or an offshoot of computer science. AI is an offshoot or computer science is an offshoot of AI. <laughs> so that mess, at it's, at it's just foundational definitional layer, that's what it looks like. You know, the goal of AI is to really, you know, create machines that 
perform like, you know, humans have human like intelligence. And while we're very far away from, you know, approximating humans, we're working towards approximating what humans do every day. So complex decision making, doing, you know, intellectual task, doing scenario analysis. And I think most importantly for our discussion today, understanding language. So having conversations. And so one of the big goals of AI, uh, while there are many, I think that's the one right now that we're experiencing this explosion in. You know, 30 years ago, I think, you know, AI competing against Gary Kasparov and the, the chess champions was this, you know, moment in time captures, pe- captured people's imagination. But today there's just been this explosion that definitely goes way past those memories, goes way past what we've experienced with Siri or Amazon Alexa in the house. Uh, and really that breakthrough that happened in about 2022, where it really broke into the conscious of the consciousness of normal, um, normal Americans, normal people globally. And now you see, you know, virtual agents, assistants, you see, you know, people who are normal knowledge workers using these tools dozens, sometimes hundreds of times a day. You see self-driving cars. I take a self-driving Waymo to and from work every single day. It's actually the only ride-sharing vehicle about my eight-year-old then. And so that acceleration, and now it's just seeing the benefits of AI every single day, multiple times a day, that, that's really what's you know, occurred over the last 30 years. You talked earlier about how the growth can be very slow and then it can jump uh, pretty drastically. So we, we, we talked about the supercomputer AI beating the chess champion, and we've seen it with Jeopardy. And, and, and it took a long time to go from that to what we're experiencing today and that uh, massive breakthrough. Yeah. And again, it's, it feels like it's happened overnight. <laughs> it was definitely slow, but then growth in the technology environment uh, and every tech change we've seen eventually becomes nonlinear. And we're at that steep, steep, steep part of the curve right now. Let's talk about uh, what you said earlier, which is part of the goal is for this computer to or technology to match humans. Um, uh, so we know humans have limitations. Uh, we can be biased. Uh, we can only process so much data. Uh, we learn slow. Uh, we get tired. Uh, we can become bored with repetition. <laughs> um, so what, what does AI do well and what are its limitations at this point? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's so many different things to list. I mean, maybe starting with some of the strengths. You know, I think AI is obviously great at handling large data volumes. You know, at its core, we're talking about processing huge amounts of data finding patterns, applying those patterns. So handling large amount of data, amounts of data, indexing it, understanding it, learning from it, massive strength first and foremost. It obviously is very fast. It can be very efficient. You know, it doesn't tire as you just talked about. Um, It's constantly learning, constantly improving. Uh, It can be very objective. We obviously need to think about ethics and morals and how we fit that in there. But if you give it, you know, a set of rules, it will be objective along the lines of those rules. And so those are the big strengths that I tend to think of, but there's obviously a long list and that's, that's far from inclusive of everything, you know, we could potentially see the weaknesses here. I think we're going to dig into all of these, I'm sure in this conversation, and these weaknesses are, are probably the root of, of all of the worries that people have around AI right now. Um, I think that it's one of the biggest ones is right where I started with, with they're great with data, but everything depends on how much quality resides in that data. Um, is it heavily dependent on, you know, where that data came from? Was that data already, you know, biased? Were there issues with it uh, that make these sort of outcomes and the training of the AI models, you know, less than optimal? So data quality has always been a weakness. It'll probably stay a weakness forever. We can just continue to improve on that. Obviously, we've all had experiences with this generation of AI and previous generations where AI is not really understanding the context of situations or the context of how we talk to each other. So it's not picking up the nuance of how we handle tone, sarcasm, slang, how we relate to each other. I think another big limitation, which, which relates to some of that context and nuance, is just AI just can't be as creative. It can't be as innovative. Its ability to come up with unique and novel ideas is just more limited. It isn't as creative because it's really built on existing data and what's come before, not what you know humans can imagine and think about into the future. 
And then I kind of touched on this before when I talked about strengths. Um, it can be objective, but also there's all of these ethical and moral decision making points, which aren't necessarily rules based. Uh, they are things that require human judgment, and they require you know us as as a society and individually. Um, to wrestle with when it comes to decision making. So those are some of the bigger weaknesses that that I think about. So let me phrase it a different way and tell me if this makes sense. Uh, I think of, if you think like a computer, if a human thinks like a computer, there's like this infinite decision tree and you kind of go down this different path. And I, I assume AI has the ability to obviously capture a lot more than a human in that respect. But also, it may have a better ability to focus on the right part of the decision tree to really emphasize, okay, it, it kind of narrows the range of future uh, potential outcomes and can really analyze that better than a human. Is that, does that make sense? I think that's exactly right. Yeah, that's one way to think about it. Okay, so you've got these uh, amazing computers that, that are getting uh, better, and you have humans. Uh, how do we coexist? And ultimately, how does one plus one equal three? I mean, I think that's been a, a question that, you know, has gone back decades and decades. It's not one we, we're, we ju- we're just rush, wrestling with now as we think about this explosion in AI. Um, I think the, the biggest sort of coexisting point to focus on is really one of augmentation versus replacement. And I think we're seeing this in this wave of AI where, uh, the AI that feels the, the most valuable, the most positive, uh, that's honestly delivering the most value today is really about augmenting you know, human beings, augment, augmenting the work they do, making them more efficient, giving them more time to do things that are more, more meaningful or valuable to them. It's not about replacing people. It's about making you know, human capabilities better, making people more efficient. Um, you know, removing tasks like note taking or you know workflows that are super tedious, and so if we always are looking at AI and saying how do we get better, you have to start from a place of thinking AI is going to augment us. It's going to make us better. It's not going to ultimately replace us. And then I think if we're going to coexist, we have to answer those tough questions around how do we have ethics around AI? How do we control AI in a way that's a, it's aligned with the success? You know, of each individual person, uh, of us as a society, of us as a species, and so figuring out AI ethics uh, is is critical to how we're going to ultimately again be augmented uh, and not make this into something that that doesn't work for us. And then I think we're also going to have to build ways to make sure that human oversight always you know sits on top of AI. Uh, we have to be able to control how this technology develops. And I think if we're, again, if we're not going to, if we're going to stay focused on augmentation and using AI to make people's lives better, we have to have that piece of oversight. What we talked about earlier is we have certain strengths and weaknesses. AI has certain strengths and weaknesses. And between the two, you could be in a much better place than you could be with just one by itself. Absolutely. Yeah. I think there's, there's tons of places where one plus one can definitely equal three. So we're seeing enhanced productivity, absolutely. Uh, you know, we're seeing customer service agents who just provide much better answers than they could provide alone, and much better answers than a than a computer could provide through a chatbot. We're seeing much better decision making. So, you know, classic example we see all the time is you know Amazon used to employ you know fifty people, hundred people on forecasting demand around you know certain seasons of of their business. They've supplemented those people with tons of algorithms over time, and they're actually getting to much better results than they than they were able to get to um, when they weren't using machine learning, or they were just relying on humans. And so here's an example definitely where the two of those pieces working together is actually getting us much better outcomes. Um, and then I think it's important to just think about personalization. Uh, and so I think there's definitely a way for AI to surface to people unique experiences surface to them what they really care about um, just save them all that time and that personalization is something you know you can't do purely with you know computation it's something that a user has to interface with the AI to ultimately you know get the full value out of it and I suppose the the main message for people is learn to use AI so you can work with it rather than try to compete against it 
a hundred percent. And I think every business leader, every management team we talk to, whether that's you know a technology management team or it's a non-technology you know space they're thinking about it the exact same way. They're thinking about how do I train you know, my people? How do I bring this technology into our organization in a way where it enhances everything we do in our core business, but it also enhances you know, how effective and productive my employees are? And can that actually help me on the cost and revenue side? They're not thinking you know, first and foremost about replacing people. They're thinking mostly about how do I get more uh, out of the investments I've made which will allow me to invest more in my business ultimately. Right. Uh, so if we take AI one step further, there's this concept of AGI. Would you tell us what that is and a realistic timeline to get there? So AGI is, is definitely the, the big fear, but also the big, the big promise in this space. And if you look at technologists, there's definitely a, a bit of a, what I would call a holy war between uh, if we do reach AGI, uh, artificial general intelligence, will that be a big positive? Will it be a big negative? Uh, the way to think about what AGI is, is it's really the ability for AI to understand, learn, apply knowledge at least as well as humans, and potentially in a way that exceeds humans. And it's not specific to certain tasks. Uh, it's not specific to language tasks or image generation or the sort of generative AI task we're seeing today, it can complete many different forms of tasks, just like a human being. It's capable of performing all sorts of intellectual problem solving. And, you know, I think that presents, you know, all sorts of potential issues, but also a really bright future. Um, in terms of, you know, getting there, uh, very difficult parlor game to play right now. I think history is kind of littered with examples of, um, you know, over exuberant predictions around what's going to happen in the near term, but then uh, you know, ultimately we we still get there. It just takes a little longer. Uh, and so right now, I mean, the progress in in generative AI is just so rapid uh, that I think there's definitely a school of thought that AGI is right around the corner. You see the improvement in all of these benchmarks around Gen AI taking the bar exam, you know, at a, at a level of the top decile or passing, you know, the MCATs, uh, you're seeing all of these sort of tests of the, of Gen AI performing specific tasks. And I think you want to extrapolate that and say, well, we're going to be at artificial general intelligence really quickly. Uh, I think if you look at some of the experts in this space, so Sam Altman at OpenAI, he talks more about, hey, this is a three to three to five year away from gen ai from sorry from agi uh the ceo of anthropic another leading you know ai company he talks more about two to three years you know there was a big survey of 2000 you know ai experts they put the the date at more like 2035 uh but again this is very difficult to forecast and, and those are just the the sort of predictions from from the you know practitioners who are, are deep in the weeds today what would you say are the potential benefits and dangers of AGI? The big, big benefits are just enhanced, you know, problem solving. So problem solving that that isn't about you know pointing you know pointing AI at one particular task or you know solve this math equation for me or you know write me a letter, but actually AGI solving a, a problem from start to finish and knowing how to go do that. Uh, knowing what individual tasks to to do, how to stitch them together, uh, how to ultimately move forward to you know what what's the next problem it should be working on, and if it wants to get to a certain place, uh, it understanding you know like a human being uh, what sort of complex steps to take to actually get there and actually you know make that problem happen. I think some of the other exciting things definitely around healthcare. Uh, there's a whole series of you know diagnostic benefits we could have, a, a whole series of rapidly scaling drug discovery benefits. Uh, there's just an incredible amount of sort of scientific and technology advancements that could come from AGI uh, that, that we probably can't get to if we're thinking about the limitations of just the number of you know scientists, <laughs> for example, or how quickly they can process data and do research. And so there are all these you know potential benefits of, of AGI. Um, 
that in some ways are just, you know, the benefits of AI and gen AI today, just placed on steroids um, and massively scaled up. And is there a risk that it becomes so productive and so powerful that humans just become lazy and, and we become a useless society? Or will we adapt and give it its tasks and take on things that maybe it can't do? That fear is definitely out there. And I think uh, it's something that that all of us individually, but also policy policymakers are going to have to constantly be be looking out for. And you're exactly right. There's there's tons of you know the potential economic disruption, loss of jobs, this sort of widespread automation problem solving that AGI could do could potentially be you know really destructive to, to society. And then if we're not able to monitor and control AGI, uh, there's all these new ethical and moral concerns. We need to work really hard uh, to make sure that AI, especially AGI, stays aligned with us and where you don't see things like <laughs> autonomous weapons or massive privacy violations uh, or you know some of the sort of security issues that can ultimately arise. And uh, the stakes are just a lot higher. The potential dangers are there. And then I think at its, at its zenith of fear, we have something which is more just existential risk, the sort of AGI takes over the world, you know, ultimately takes off and doesn't just become a peer of humans, but at an accelerating rate gets, you know, super intelligent relative to humans. I think these are all gradations of how much risk we face. I don't think we need to we'll necessarily end up on either side of that. It, the, the reality is we'll probably exist somewhere in the middle. Um, but all these are, are real dangers and they should be taken seriously. And we should be developing a framework for how to control them alongside all of the advancements, you know, we're seeing again, every week, every month, every year. And, and I guess there's been enough science fiction movies where <laughs> you, you have things like this happen. And so we've got a glimpse into what the future may look like. And usually those stories don't end positively for humans. So <laughs> I could see why there would be some hesitation in letting it just Run on it. It's it's definitely the case when you when you when you train a lot of the gen AI and gen AI models on data that's focused on science fiction, they put out a pretty dark view of the world. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so let's talk about the kind of the industries and the and the jobs and the various functions that are the low hanging fruit that AI is likely to take over quickly, and which tasks would you say have a much longer way to go? No, that's a great question. I think it's one we think about a lot just as an investment team, because a lot of this low-hanging fruit is where, you know, value creation is happening right now. And uh, this isn't, you know, things we think will happen. It's actually happening at a pretty interesting pace. And so some of the obvious low-hanging fruit are, you know, things like customer service. This is happening all across the public technology markets and businesses you can go buy today. This is responding to you know common questions, managing FAQs, just all the basic interactions and troubleshooting between a company and its customers. And we're just seeing leaps and bounds, measurable improvements there. And so I think that has to fit in the low-hanging fruit category because we're already seeing it. It's already very measurable. Um, these AI assistants and the augmentation they can bring to customer service is, is really just incredible. And then, you know, data entry, processing. All of that, you know, AI has been chipping away at for a while, but Gen AI has has just made that meaningfully more powerful. And we're talking about you know orders of magnitude improvement and how fast and careful we can do that. And then you know we're seeing you know the, the changes in transportation and logistics. You know, Waymo's transporting people all over San Francisco and Los Angeles. Uh, definitely in financial services, there's low hanging fruit there. Uh, there's tons of advancements in figuring out financial fraud that that we have now that we didn't have before, you know, LLMs and before the current uh, advances in AI. Uh, and so there's a whole host of, of low-hanging fruit pieces that, you know, there are jobs happening right now where Gen AI is stepping in to supplement people. And there's actually measurable value getting created, you know, as we speak. On your second question, in terms of what's going to take longer, there are jobs that kind of go back to what we were talking about before, things where AI, you know, it struggles more. And so I think for a lot of people, that's the creative professions first and foremost. So when it comes to originality, emotional intelligence, being a musician, you know, being someone who creates art, 
you know, be working in advertising. Those are really difficult things for AI to do because, again, it's focused on data that's come in the past. It's tough to be, it's very difficult for it to be original. And so those sort of roles and jobs to be done on the creative side, I think, are just really difficult uh, to be uh, to be automated at this point. I think a lot of legal and regulatory situations, I think that AI can help uh, with some of the rote tasks, it can help with search, it can help, you know, do some common documents. But those are spaces where you can't have error rates that are even 5 10%. Uh, the, the potential um, issues of making mistakes are just too high. And I don't think AI is at a place where the thinking and care and duty that a you know senior attorney puts into a process is is going to be easily replicated by where by where AI sits right now, and then I think also just you know healthcare. I think again uh, the stakes are very high. Um, I think AI can can supplement a doctor or a decision maker. It can help them with some diagnostics, but when it comes to actually generating a plan, doing all the cost benefit analysis, doing the emotional work with a client. That's just going to take a really long time for for generative AI to have a big a big impact. I guess you could think of it as having a really smart analyst that has more data than anybody and is really smart and keeps getting smarter and smarter and can give you great information. But you make the ultimate decision. Absolutely. You mentioned financial services. Obviously, you and I both work in that industry. Uh, I'm curious how, what you think about uh, investing. Is that something that can be taken over by AI or is it, does it have limitations that prevent it from being as good as humans? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a nuanced question. I, I think there are definitely um, ways gen AI can help uh, humans in decision-making. It can help us process a lot of the work we're doing. Uh, it can do, you know, great uh, summary work. It can help pull apart different data points that reside in, different work we're doing you know, at the ground level, talking to management teams, talking to experts. And so, you know, from what I observe day to day as a fundamental equity investor who's trying to make you know, the, the best decisions possible, um, it can be really powerful in terms of automating the work that we're doing every day. Um, but it would actually come, but when it comes to actually going out into the real world and collecting that data, um, analyzing people, figuring out those things that are difficult for a machine to really understand, I don't think it can really replace that piece of decision making. I think it can make us a lot better. We use it every single day. I have, you know, the major LLMs open in my computer and a tab all day. Our team is using these systems all the time. But I think ultimately decision making, ultimate decision making when it comes to understanding what businesses you want to own for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, that's very difficult. Um, I think in the world of quantitative finance, AI has has had a presence there for a very long time. I think it will continue to get better and, and be a part of that. But you know, I think that's a different approach, uh, and maybe that's you know a much shorter term approach um, to how you know investing is done. Uh, and I think you and I both know there are, there are many different ways to to be successful as an investor. Uh, one of my prior guests uh, was Martin Escobari. Uh, co-president at General Atlantic. And he talked about now they have another person or a computer on their investment committee. Uh, she's not voting yet, but she's AI powered and she provides great insight and she's gaining credibility amongst these great investors. And you can think of it as just, you know, one plus one equals three, another example of that. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I mean, we're, we're processing, you know, all of our our notes and our main repository, but we're also processing all of our investment memos. And we're definitely trying to find, you know, blind spots or things that we've missed on some of our companies. And then we're feeding in a lot of third party information too. So, you know, all of the transcripts, um, all of the additional data that that's more readily available and mixing that with uh, the data and notes and the real sort of information we're capturing from meeting with management teams directly. So I totally understand you could have not just a, not just another analyst, but you could have this improving you know decision maker uh, who maybe will never you know get to Martin's level, but can be a really powerful voice around the table. Right, and, and the way I've I've heard it described, which I think makes sense, and, and I'd like to hear your thoughts, is AI works really well when you have a lot of data. There's 
actually limited data in financial markets, you know, compared to billions of data points elsewhere. Uh, there's a low signal to noise ratio um, that you have players that are impacting prices and those players evolved. And if you were the only one with AI technology, you'd have a huge advantage, but when everybody has it, it's not as big of an advantage. And, and also when you study history and you just look at financial markets history, that was one path that history took, but could have easily taken thousands of other paths. And so you, so the data can become overconfident that the future is going to resemble the past. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just curious about your thoughts about all of that and how it relates to AI taking over investing. I think that's exactly right. Um, I think that, that if you think about the extremes here, and as you said, there, there's relatively you know, a small amount of, of data in the financial world. The data I'm talking about on the ground, meeting with management teams, that, that's an, a tiny amount of data, not just inside of our firm, but across the entire industry. On the other extreme, we have the big large language models from OpenAI, where you're getting to a place where 70% of all printed words are inside of those models, and we're getting you know most of video globally into those models. And so those models are getting incredible at certain tasks because they have you know almost the history, of, <laughs> not just of human knowledge, but the history of how almost every word is related to every word uh, on the internet and more expansively. And so I think you're absolutely right. The, the problems you can solve here when you have <laughs> a quantity of data aggregated and trained against are going to be different problems than when you have, you know, a relatively, you know, smaller data set and you're going to need, you know, different levels of, of human judgment input there. So in terms of AI, uh, we've seen some pretty big bugs that need to be resolved. And we've seen examples of this brilliant machine that makes obvious mistakes that a human would rarely make. Uh, would you talk through some of those? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I think the the one we see pretty frequently is just the the lack of common sense. So there's just a whole lot of, you know, world knowledge and common sense reasoning that we're learning our entire lives from our parents, but also our experience as we move through the world. And, you know, we see machines fail to do that pretty frequently. Going back to the autonomous car piece, you know, autonomous cars can take us through, you know, dangerous neighborhoods or, you know, cause us to do things that that aren't perfect for the social context or raise certain safety concerns. And so there's just all of this common sense that you use throughout your entire day that you use in everyday life that isn't easy to pick up from that big, you know, backward looking generalized data set. Um, there are things that you've experienced. You know, I think another big bug is just decision making. So like we talked about it, we talked about earlier, the 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 quality of the data really matters. And so if you're feeding in whole bunch of data that that's biased what you're going to get on the other side is very biased um and that's gonna you know have discriminatory lending practice issues um you're going to have potential issues in how you screen candidates for jobs and so there's this big bug around bias that's driven by the ultimate data that goes into these systems and then i think we've talked about this a number of times but but this again this ethical and moral reasoning piece um you know simple things like autonomous vehicles deciding you know, what's the optimal decision when they're thinking about, you know, potential harm to this human being, this per this, this piece of property, et cetera, many decisions that, you know, are very common sense, somewhat easy for human beings to, to answer many difficult decisions that you would need a, you know, an ethicist <laughs> to work on, uh, with maybe a priest or a rabbi. Uh, and so, uh, that piece, the ethical and moral reasoning piece is, is a big bug that we're going to be working on for a long time. It's not easily solvable. How does the AI breakthrough that we're experiencing compare to other technological innovations in the past, like the railroad or the internet? Yeah, I think that's an incredible um, comparison. I think comparing it to the internet, uh, that's maybe too close a comparison to what we're experiencing. I think my personal opinion, I think the opinion of a lot of AI experts, is this is bigger than the internet. You do again have to go back to the railway and electricity, and so maybe I'll just focus on that on the railroad one because I think that it is it is different enough. Enough time has passed, and so you know the middle model we work with in internally, and it's one that we're not geniuses. I'm sure we've we've taken it in over time from reading and from what we've learned in the world and other people have learned is that you know any big tech innovation, you know it has to improve the lives of human beings on a really massive scale. It has to, you know, transform industries. It has to improve connectivity and transform industries while it's doing that. And then it has to create, you know, new markets. 
And so in the case of railways, you had this enormous improvement in daily life. You know, people could, could travel and see each other and, you know, see their relatives. Um, the world literally just got, you know, smaller over time. And that improved not just their ability to see their families, but also the opportunities they had in jobs and education and in access to markets. And so daily life, you know, is dramatically improved. I think in AI, we're seeing daily life improvements with, you know, agents inside the cars or personal transportation uh, or, you know, Apple intelligence in your phone. But that's just the very beginning of the transformation of daily life we're going to see over the coming decades. And then from a transformation of industries, you know, improved connectivity, we've been having this conversation here about the innovation and change we're going to see in healthcare, in finance, in all of these critical industries that touch all of us every day and do make our lives better. The railroad obviously revolutionized transportation, you know, it enabled, you know, fast movement of people. There was every single industry was touched by what happened. And then on creation of new markets, a whole bunch of the industrialization of America uh, and globally, you know, moving coal and steel and commodity products in a way that, you know, made human life better, you know, railways did that. And I think we're stimulating all of our existing industries in a way that's going to create new markets, new knowledge markets, but also ultimately going to create entirely new markets and entirely new jobs to be done um, that we can't even, you know, understand at this point. In the same way that if you were sitting there at the advent of the internet, sorry, at the railroad, at the railroad, um, you couldn't have really seen those new markets, the new facilitation of trade that was probably coming our way. We've seen this before, but it's not exactly the same. No, there's, I think, up and down the stack from that high level piece all the way down to the investing stack. There are there are commonalities, there are things we've seen, but there are also things that are distinctly different this time. I've heard the argument that. AI progress will be constrained not by the technology, but by society's acceptance and ability to keep pace uh, and its interest in protecting the people. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. I think right now we're seeing the technology advance at such a rapid pace. I think, you know, as I walk around San Francisco, as I spend, you know, uh, time with, you know, my friends and network and I, I spend time inside these companies. It's just this incredible explosion. It's reinvigorating San Francisco, but I think it's just reinvigorating technology, broadly speaking. And so that explosion, how fast it's moving day to day, week to week, month to month, society is going to take longer and it's going to have to catch up. And it may always be a little bit behind. Um, But if we're going to actually use these big advancements and not rein them in uh, too fast, society is going to have to accept these, these technologies or find a way to accept them. And so you know, I think people are going to have to learn to, you know, trust these systems. They're going to have to have great experiences that they feel are safe. Uh, they're going to make sure that they feel these, these systems are safe, that they're ethical, that they're monitored by the right regulatory bodies. We're going to need to see governments step in to some extent and, you know, deal with difficult thorny issues like data privacy, but also regulation stepping in and mitigating some of these really wild risks we talked about earlier. Like, how do you regulate, you know, artificial um, general intelligence if we get there? And then I think as a society and just how do we think about economic distribution and potential unrest, this whole idea of how you protect jobs, uh, but also allow, you know, new jobs to be created uh, as a result of AI. So striking that delicate, you know, balance is something that, as a society, we'll have to figure out, the regulators will have to figure out. Um, and so I completely agree. And then overlaid on top of all of that, which I think in Silicon Valley, we maybe talk more about, but I don't know if society talks quite as much about it, is just the you know global security and competition issues. And so if we're not moving fast, if we're not enabling this innovation in other countries where, where we are competitive, where there are national security you know, interests are doing that, Uh, are we leaving ourselves vulnerable? And so we have all of these competing concerns uh, and we have to strike the right balance between, you know, how fast the technology is moving, the benefits from that, you know, society accepting that, us regulating that, and then making sure that that we're not constricting it so much that we're falling behind or putting ourselves at a disadvantage as a society. 
And I suppose one lesson history has taught us is you can't fight technological innovation, uh, but you can try to manage its pace, but to a, to a limited degree because of reasons like you described in terms of competition of others and just the natural progress that you know humans experience through time. No, I think that you're you're absolutely right about that, and uh, and in many cases at the front end of every one of these big innovations, we we see some commonalities as we said, and one of the big ones is this: you know, we will lose a bunch of jobs, the economy will be ruined, uh, this technology innovation won't work for most people, and maybe it takes some time to sort that big change out. Maybe it takes time to sort out you know the the winners and losers of you know industrialization or the internet um or globalization but eventually you know new jobs get created to replace those old jobs and we we look back and say wow i'm so glad that technology happened because it actually did make all of our lives better it made all of us more prosperous there was this difficult period but a whole bunch of new jobs were created and ultimately you know we have a much bigger pie that is beneficial to many more people as a result of this change in our society Let's dig into the key components of an AI infrastructure and trying to keep it not as technical if possible. That would be ideal. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I think just right up front before we jump into the infrastructure piece, we've talked a little bit about, you know, large language models. Those are the, the big sort of breakthrough. That's what we're seeing in, you know, chat GPT. That's really the foundation of this big AI shift we're seeing right now. This whole infrastructure today is really built around enabling that big change, you know, the large language models and all the benefits they, they deliver. And so as you're thinking about creating an entirely new technology stack, an entirely new infrastructure, it's all in service of making those foundational models, you know, better user experiences. And so when you think about a technology stack, you start most simply with the infrastructure at the bottom, which, which tends to be hardware. All of these middle technologies, which help enable the, use, the usage of that infrastructure. And then at the very top, you have applications. So this is where the difficult work actually gets done, where you know, humans are actually interfacing with this core infrastructure, with these enabling technologies. And this is why we build infrastructure. We build infrastructure to do useful work at the application layer. And so for AI right now, at this foundational level, that's where most of the dollars are flowing today. That's where most of the revenue growth is. And we're putting that infrastructure in the ground you know, for the very first time. And so that's why NVIDIA you know, has just been on this incredible ride, not just as a, as a stock, but obviously on revenues and its criticality to the development of the space. And so NVIDIA, for example, you know, it's added almost $2 trillion of market cap year to date. Uh, that's an entire Google. Uh, it's, it's more than 10x free cash flow in, in a matter of quarters uh, at incredible scale. And so we've never seen anything, anything like that at any, any point uh, in you know, modern financial markets. And it's really because this foundational market, this infrastructure, um, it absolutely requires graphical processing units from NVIDIA uh, it needs those semiconductors, and the demand from the big clouds for those semiconductors is essentially limitless right now. NVIDIA can't can make enough to, to build that infrastructure into the ground. And then riding on top of that infrastructure are these large language models from the companies you hear about every day, like OpenAI, uh, where they're training on these massive data sets, data sets like I talked about earlier that, that look at you know 50 to 60 percent of all the data, all the printed word, you know, that has ever been created. And training one of those models is incredibly expensive. It costs hundreds of millions of dollars. It will cost billions of dollars in the future. Um, and once you've done that training, you can actually start to do useful work for people. You can actually make ChatGPT get better and better over time. And then at that middle level, we have all these, uh, these technologies that essentially help advance LLMs. So help technologists utilize uh, the underlying technology, make LLMs better, build better models, essentially get the data and the access to the infrastructure ready for that application layer where humans are actually going to do useful work. And I'm happy to talk about you know, some other companies that are in that sort of middle layer, that application layer, 
Uh, there's businesses that are at massive scale today that are putting AI into their applications. There are you know, native companies that are getting built with AI at the very beginning that are doing application work. And obviously, you know, if you've worked with ChatGPT, that's the quintessential AI native application that's solving you know, real problems for users today. Yeah, let's talk about some of the leading public and private companies uh, in this space. Uh, what do they do? What, what makes them the leader? Yeah, absolutely. So I already talked about NVIDIA. They make you know, semiconductors, specifically graphical processing units. These graphical processing units um, allow for parallel computing, and parallel computing is absolutely essential to the machine learning and the building of LLMs we've experienced so far. Obviously, you also have the big hyperscaler public clouds uh, that have really revolutionized the internet the last 40 years, but have particularly revolutionized the cloud and are now critical to the adoption of AI. So that's Microsoft Azure, Amazon Web Services, and Google Cloud. Uh, they're obviously all enormous beneficiaries. Then as you move up the stack, uh, you end up with you know, a number of public and private companies Some of the big private companies uh, are really around how do you store these LLM models, uh, how do you collaborate on them, how do you store the weights that you see inside of these models. These are businesses like, you know, Langchain, Llama Index, uh, Weights and Biases, Hugging Face. They're all solving different parts of that issue. And then you also have businesses that are trying to sort of monitor what's happening around these models and look inside them, hopefully, and figure out uh, how the algorithms are actually working and how they can be tuned and and improved. And then that application layer, there's a long tail of AI native companies um, that are trying to build applications from the ground up that are heavily reliant on AI. But then there are public companies today like ServiceNow and Microsoft and GitLab and a long, long list that are taking all of this AI technology that's being built um, by the public cloud companies and businesses like OpenAI and embedding that in their applications today to make those applications better. And so the quintessential example is ServiceNow, uh, which is a business that helps in one area deliver customer service, uh, deliver service to, you know, from HR to employees or from customer service agents to, to consumers. And they've embedded all of these Gen AI uh, products throughout those those use cases, and they're actually able to charge meaningfully more, you know, up to fifty percent more because they're really um, getting to measurable returns uh, from integrating this technology. We look at the news, Open AI, and many of the LLMs seem to get a lot of the headlines. What's your outlook for the LLMs? Yeah, that is something we wrestle with um, all the time, and you're absolutely right. Those companies are are pushing the state of the art. Uh, they have the capital uh, from VCs, but also from strategics. Uh, they have all the leading researchers. Uh, they have in- incredible technologists, and now they're building out commercial teams for the first time. And so, those LLMs, those foundational models, uh, there's probably three to five that really matter right now. Plus, you know, an open source model called Llama that's developed by Facebook. In the near term, I think we're very positive there. Uh, they're advancing, again, the state of the art very fast. They're training these LLMs at, at, at incredible speeds. And I think the distance between you know, where they're at today and someone who wanted to launch a new foundational model is, is enormously wide at this point. And so we're very positive on those companies in the near term. I think over a longer period of time, there are, are real risks there. Um, so. You know, there's definitely situations that could arise where um, they're all training on the same data and uh, they all are kind of getting to, you know, a similar sort of terminal level of effectiveness. And at that point, I do think it's it's more of a race to the bottom. Uh, there's also potential issues where, you know, good enough may, may be okay for the vast majority of AI use cases. You may not need to be on the leading cutting edge model for every single AI use case. Um, and then I also think that there are just issues around, um, they're providing, you know, API access to sort of core generalized, 
AI function, but really most of the value creation is happening at the application layer. And so if you think about the historic model for technology innovation, you usually put these infrastructure companies at the bottom at the very start. And so in the internet, you had, you know, the big investments in semiconductors, in Cisco, in all of the physical infrastructure. And then you had, you know, the application companies like Google that came at the very end. And the amount of value that gets created at the end of the application layer tends to dwarf the amount of value that gets created in the infrastructure layer. And so right now we may be at we may be at the phase, and I think we're at this phase where we're generating a ton of value as we put the base layer infrastructure in. And that's NVIDIA, it's these large language models like OpenAI, but ultimately most of the recurring uh, value that's going to be sustainable is going to reside at the application layer. And it's probably going to reside in many companies that haven't been built yet or are being built as we speak. There's been a perception among investors that larger uh, incumbent tech companies are the primary beneficiaries of AI. How do you feel they are positioned today? Yeah, right now in the near term, that's that's an absolute fact. Um, you know, going back to that infrastructure piece, you need to put this infrastructure in the ground if there's any hope for delivering great experiences for people and actually advancing AI over time. And that looks like an incredible amount of investment today. And so it's billions of dollars spent on NVIDIA chips. It's tens of billions of dollars invested in these models. Uh, that's all flowing to, you know, the semiconductor companies. It's flowing towards businesses that are building out data centers, uh, building out just the core physical infrastructure to deliver that computing. And it's flowing to the big clouds who are making those resources and those data centers accessible to AI driven companies. And so right now, most of the value creation uh, is happening at the largest companies because they're, they're best equipped to go put that infrastructure in the ground. But if it plays out like the internet, uh, that probably won't be the case, you know, five to 10 years from now. What do you think the AI funding environment looks like today? It's been very uh, healthy, as you might imagine. Yeah. Uh, and valuations have obviously been uh, pretty difficult to swallow, uh, depending on, on your investment approach and what stage you're investing in. I think it's important to sort of dig in the covers of what that environment looks like um, specifically. And so most of the capital, we'll call it 60 to 70%, has flowed towards those large language models. So headed towards OpenAI, uh, towards Anthropic, a competitor to OpenAI, uh, towards all of that tooling around those foundational models. And then there's this long amount, long tail amount of capital that's been focused on, you know, some of those applications that are going to be get built, they're AI specific. Um, some of these technologies that help, you know, the consumption of these core LLMs um, in different ways. But I think from a quantum of capital, it's still very focused that infrastructure layer. It's very concentrated in a few companies. And then you have this long tail of companies where valuations um, are, are all over the place, but, but definitely high and potentially rising. Uh, but it's very difficult to pick winners and losers at this point in that group. Yeah, you talked about high valuations. We see that in public markets as there's so much optimism uh, surrounding AI and companies that are touching AI. Uh, mm -hmm. Are we in an AI bubble akin to the internet bubble? Uh, do you expect a correction? How do you compare those two? You've definitely seen some multiple expansion. So certainly NVIDIA's multiple has expanded if we're just looking at that company as the quintessential explanation for this. But also, you know, free cash flow in that company has more than 10 x um, And that's different than what we saw in the, uh, in the internet period. Um, we saw multiple increases, 5, 10 x 15 x you know, increases in fundamental revenues at a handful of businesses, um, but not nearly as fast as what we're seeing with NVIDIA, where that's all happening in this compressed, you know, four to eight quarter time frame. And so for these leading companies, um, that are really driving stock market returns around AI. A lot of that, if you deconstruct it, really is driven by fundamental growth right now. On the other side of that, you know, whenever we potentially, you know, go into your typical uh, sort of, hey, we we're really positive, but there's potential concerns in the near term. Maybe the narrative shifts, and there is some deleveraging happening there. 
uh, some of that growth may start to tail off and then valuations will decline. And so I don't know where we are along that wave of you know valuations relative to fundamental growth. I do know, unlike the 1990s, the leading companies right now are actually generating a lot of fundamental growth right now. It's not mostly you know valuation expansion that's driving fundamental returns. I guess the key question is, how long will the fundamental returns persist? You know, when you go through a, a phase where all of a sudden you get this explosion in growth, it's easy to extrapolate that over a long period of time. And there's a huge uncertainty around, are, you, are we underestimating the growth? Are we significantly overestimating the growth? It's hard to know. So it's, it, I guess it, it becomes riskier at that point, riskier to invest and riskier not to invest. Yeah, it's a perfect, <laughs> that is such a good summation <laughs> you just put out there, especially the very last point. You, you, you don't want to miss uh, the value creation when you're at this steep part of the curve and it's very difficult to predict what NVIDIA's you know, revenues could be in two quarters and four quarters. But at the same time, we know these things are never straight lines. While we may be super positive on where AI is in 10 or 20 years, uh, just like, you know, we're super, we were super positive in 99 or 2000 around where the internet could be in 20 years. Uh, along that path, there's going to be periods where, you know, maybe some of these companies don't grow and you actually see a lot of, you know, deleveraging in a business like NVIDIA, even if, you know, shutting your eyes over 10 years, you're going to end up with a business that's 10 or 20 times larger from a fundamental perspective. My last question is, if we look forward long term uh, for the potential for AI, are you confident that uh, it's going to be transformative? Um, and are there certain proof points uh, that you're looking for uh, in terms of its potential, uh, particularly relative to what people expect? Yeah, of course. So I think over the long term, we're very positive. We're already seeing enough point use cases and adoption that, that are broad enough. You see how those could scale and expand from here. So we are very early, but we're seeing, you know, measurable adoption, measurable returns, and we're monitoring, you know, an enormous number of those proof points. And so I kind of think about those proof points in two categories. So there's laying the foundation, which we spent a lot of time just talking about, which is, are we putting the capital in the ground? Are we building the infrastructure? Um, are we putting out the data centers, deploying the chips, building the foundational models? That will allow us to, you know, deliver incredible experiences that will allow for adoption. Everyone's really focused there. A lot of great proof points there. Um, I think we're going to get there. I think we're going to build the infrastructure we need for the next 10 or 20 years in the same way we built the infrastructure we needed for the, you know, internet. Maybe we, we overbuilt in 95 to 2001 with, you know, Cisco and all the fiber we put in the ground. But that fiber became the backbone of Verizon, and that was required because the requirements of the internet ended up being thousands of times larger than we thought. And so maybe we're at that point right now, um, but I look at how, how we're laying the foundation. We may be overlaying it for the near term, but we're probably underlaying it <laughs> for the long term. And so we're measuring those proof points, those, those adoption, those, those laying the foundation proof points. And then on the adoption side, Thinking about it, you know, on the consumer side, thinking about it on the company side, on the consumer side, we're looking at user growth. We're looking at how frequently people are using these products, the sort of work they're doing. We're looking at the applications and the user experiences and the user interfaces. Are there applications arising that make this feel like magic where someone doesn't even understand or really care what's happening under the covers? They're just having magical experiences. And most of the time, they you know, interact with these AI-powered features and applications. They're getting incredible results. And they're not getting turned off. And so you can really measure that, that adoption and engagement and then look for those you know, proof points of, are, these are there these incredible applications that have great experiences on the front end? And then on the enterprise side, are real business problems getting solved um, that are measurable, that have real ROI attached to them? And across many industries and many use cases, we are seeing exactly that. Um, we can look at usage data. We can look at you know some of the revenue opportunities that have been unlocked by generative AI. Uh, we can look at some of the measurable increases in productivity for existing employees. We can look at some of the cost savings that have come about as as a result of Gen AI. And so you know I think on the adoption side we see you know both quantitative and qualitative ways to measure that consumer and enterprise adoption. 
And this was such an interesting conversation, Jacob. I, I appreciate you taking the time. I could do this all day. <laughs> and, we just, <laughs> no, and, we just, and we just scratched the surface of the qualitative piece down to the, 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 you know, the weeds, right? Yeah. And, and, and your passion comes through. And uh, I wish I could sit in your seat for a week and be in front of all these great you know, companies that you're constantly analyzing. And uh, to, to me, just being on the front lines during this uh, technological revolution is pretty fascinating. So, uh, so thank it's you. It's never been a more exciting time personally to do this job. And it's never been a more exciting time to be in this industry and actually to be back in San Francisco where, uh, and just the Bay Area in general, where that you can feel that energy um, in a way that, uh, you know, my peers who, who were investing in the 90s, uh, it's the closest thing they can describe to that that sort of spirit of innovation and excitement. That's awesome. Thank you, Jacob. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Please visit our website at insightfulinvestor.org to access past shows and learn more about our podcast. If you have questions, feel free to email us at info at insightfulinvestor.org. And if you enjoyed the discussion, please subscribe to this podcast to ensure you don't miss future episodes. And don't forget to forward today's conversation to others you think would enjoy listening. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as legal, business, investment, or tax advice. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Evoke Advisors, their affiliates, or companies featured. Due to industry regulations, participants on this podcast are instructed not to make specific trade recommendations nor reference past or potential profits. And listeners are reminded that securities trading, commodity trading, and alternative investments are complex and carry a risk of substantial losses. As such, they are not suitable for all investors. Listeners should be aware that guests featured on The Insightful Investor may have current or past associations with Evoke Advisors or the host, including as an investment manager of a private fund opportunity by Evoke, or access through an affiliated Evoke fund, or as a client. Participation as a guest on the podcast should not be perceived as an endorsement or testimonial with respect to Evoke Advisors, the podcast host, or their services. Similarly, the inclusion of a guest on the podcast does not imply that Evoke Advisors or the host endorses the guest or any company with which they may be affiliated or employed. Evoke has neither paid nor received compensation from guests for their participation.